going to be uh, Professor Scott Hubbard. Uh, I first met Scott when he was a scientist and a manager at uh, NASA Ames Research Center. Worked together somewhat on the Mars aerial platform mission, the balloon mission concept. Uh, then Scott went off to uh, become NASA's uh, Mars czar or in the, around the 2000 time frame. And uh, I, I believe it was Scott who uh, altered the Mars program to include uh, in particular, the Spirit and Opportunity missions and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which in my view have been uh, the heart um, and perhaps the, the, the best accomplishments of the uh, Mars program that has been uh, underway since uh, 1996. Um, and uh, since then, Scott has moved on. He is now a professor at Stanford, uh, and he remains very active in space policy and space politics and developing uh, NASA's plans for the future of Mars, and he's also been a fighter to try to save the 2016 and 2018 Mars missions. So uh, without further uh, ado, I'll uh, let Scott begin as soon as he is it ready. You, are you wired? I think we're just about ready to go here. Thank you, Bob, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, the story I have to tell you about going to Mars uh, is a half hour version. The much, much longer version is contained in this book, which I could not write until I left NASA. Uh, it's a little bit of science, a little bit of engineering, some budget, some politics, and my very favorite Dan Golden stories. <laughs> For those of you who knew uh, anything about the very, very creative uh, and uh, individualistic uh, administrator of NASA, uh, you might appreciate there, and I think we're going to do a, a book signing thing after, after my talk. So, exploring Mars, following the water, uh, why Mars? You all know why. It's the most Earth-like of other planets, the one most likely to have developed life. It is the target for human exploration. And why water? Of course, that's because that's a fundamental ingredient of life as we know it. So, how did it get involved in this? Well, I've been interested in life in the universe since I was about nine or ten years old, which is uh, much longer than 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, always wanted to imagine what it was like to find life on another world. And uh, in, I will talk a little bit later about having the chance to propose what became the Mars Pathfinder mission in 1990, 22 years ago now. Um, but what happened was we had the Mars rock. Many of you remember Allen Hill's meteorite. Uh, little squiggly things that might have been nanofossils from Mars set off a huge uh, storm of debate within the scientific community that was very positive, and it caused NASA to say, we've got to go to Mars at every opportunity with an orbiter and a lander, and uh, the administrator at the time had a favorite theory he called faster, better, cheaper. And what he said to the team uh, from JPL was, well, that Mars Pathfinder mission was really cool, so now I want you to give me two missions for the price of one. And uh, he put the folks in the, a box from which they could not escape. And uh, let's see, let's get back here. Uh, we seem to have lost power, that's why it's going to sleep. So maybe uh, they can come and check the plug there. In the meantime, I'll keep it awake. So what happened was, I think everybody remembers, that there was Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander launched in 1998. And the landing and the orbit insertion in 1999 were very much like what we're experiencing here today. In fact, I was up in the VVIP room uh, at JPL. Uh, Golden was there, uh, a new associate administrator uh, named Ed Weiler. And uh, we were all sitting waiting for the signals to appear, first for the orbiter, then for the lander, nothing. And it was a profound embarrassment to NASA, to the administrator, faster, better, cheaper, the entire world uh, stood back and gasped what had happened. Well, there was a study by a very well-known guy uh, <clears throat> named Tom Young, a famous executive, famous NASA guy, and uh, they found two proximate causes. This is uh, uh, mishap speak for the thing you can identify most closely. 
One was the uh, incorrect conversion from metric to English. And of course, the whole world had a good laugh. Ha, 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 you know, NASA can't even remember how to do this. Uh, the other was not fully testing the flight hardware with the flight software. And that's why Mars Polar Lander crashed. But the real cause, and to uh, Mr. Golden's credit, it was that he pushed this project group into a box of fixed schedule, fixed budget, fixed requirements, and he didn't let them escape from that. And so they made all sorts of compromises and took foolish risk. The previous panel was just terrific. I really believe in this. Uh, and you can take risk, but it must be thoughtful, reasoned risk, not forgetting to test or not being able to test the flight hardware with the flight software. That's a foolish risk. So that's the point at which Dan Golden reached out to me, uh, uh, put, almost literally put his arm around me and said, son, we need you. Come to Washington and fix the mess. And that was almost exactly what he said, a little more colorful, actually, uh, than that, but uh, with a few other words thrown in. Um, but I got the charter, which is truly extraordinary. Maybe once in a career, you get the chance to go in with the blessing from the top down and take a nearly clean sheet of paper and build a new space program for a decade. I wasn't told just go put a team together and look at one mission. Look at the entire decade and come up with a program that would understand Mars. So we completely redefined everything in uh, that year and a half or so from about March of 2000. We unveiled it in October uh, and then did some more work and ended up with a final product about June of 2001. And this was what we came up with, which was a science-driven effort to understand Mars as a system not to hit a home run and understand life on Mars in one single mission, but to put together a program that would look at the present and past environment, the climate, geology, and particularly habitability. And so that brings us to today and to tomorrow and tomorrow night, where Curiosity is the last mission in this queue and represents, I sincerely believe, the turning point from follow the water I'm going to show you in the next 20 minutes or so, so how that turned out. It represents the inflection point from that into seeking the fingerprints of life. And so I think we are poised, as we are in a cusp with commercial space flight, and a cusp in understanding. I think we're that close to understanding the habitability of Mars from a scientific perspective. So we adopted a strategy. Uh, if you're in Washington inside the Beltway, you have to be able to explain what you're doing with the taxpayer's money in short, succinct phrases with small words. And this is really critical. Uh, and follow the water fit perfectly. Uh, a way of explaining that we were going to be driven by a fundamental requirement for life as we know it. And so uh, I'll go into a little more detail later on, but we had Mars a Global Surveyor there operating. Uh, we launched Mars Odyssey in 2001. Maybe just a very quick uh, sidebar here that you might appreciate. Uh, NASA, of course, is a bureaucratic agency. If Garrett Reisman is a recovering astronaut, I'm a recovering bureaucrat. And what they came up with is a name that they presented to me. I was the first Mars czar for this mission was Ares. And I said, well, you know, yeah, that's sort of okay, I suppose. I mean, it, it is, you know, a word for Mars. And, and I said, well, but, but it's 2001, right, that we're going to launch. It's Space Odyssey 2001. And, and they said, well, you know, there's copyright and intellectual property and Arthur C. Clarke, you know. Blah. And I said, did you ask him? And they said, well, no. I said, well, let's ask him. A friend of mine, Gentry Lee, works at JPL, co-authored several of the Rama books. He's a very good friend with Arthur C. Clarke. I said, would you ask Sir Arthur? Sure, send off an email. Sir Arthur C. Clarke, Earth, or would you uh, let us use this name? Absolutely, go for it. So that's, <laughs> we wrote a new memo, it proved, and so that's how Mars Odyssey came to be. And sometimes you gotta challenge the system and say, well, you know, let's, let's go for it. So Mars Odyssey in 01, uh, the twin rovers in 03, what a story there. Spirit and opportunity. Opportunity is in its ninth year of operations. The warranty was only good for 90 days. 
Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, our spy satellite around Mars in 2005, the Phoenix Scout to the North Pole in 07, and landing tomorrow, 10.31 p.m., wheels down, uh, the last one in this decade, Q, Mars Science Lab, Curiosity. <clears throat> so how did we do this? Just a little bit about how do you put a decade-long program together. Some of you may have heard uh, of what systems engineering is. This is where you take the piece parts in a project and you make sure they work together. I bumped this idea up a notch to call it program systems engineering. So you take the decade-long science goals, you take a set of technology readiness that you increasingly invest in technology to get it ready, and then you look at a whole bag of other stuff like launch opportunities and the budget and, and what you need to make it work, and you put this together and you keep testing one of these against the other and you come out with the mission queue eventually that, that I just showed you. And part of this was to realize that just sending us orbiter and a lander at every opportunity didn't make any sense. Why were you doing that? What you really needed to do was to do reconnaissance, then ground truth, then even better reconnaissance and ground truth. And so this whole sequence of missions didn't happen by accident. We wanted to have the best available resolution, looking from orbit, and then go test something that we'd seen. Then go another step in orbital reconnaissance and test that. So following the water drove us to a sequence of missions and certain landing sites that were all hooked together. This is a, a linked set of missions. They are not independent of each other and, and have it been for, for 12 years. So let's take the first example. Uh, this was published in uh, June of 2000. It was the first possible evidence of modern water where we saw things very young, no craters that looked for all the world like a flash flood uh, in a desert or a flash flood, in this case on the side of a recent volcano. This is Mount, Mount St. Helens. So uh, this came from Mars Global Surveyor, as did this, uh, indication of maybe an ocean at the North Pole, and particularly this piece here. It's about the size of Connecticut, and this is a mineral detected from orbit that you only find on Earth after long exposure to water. This was a place we had to go. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So we, this was up there flying. We launched Odyssey. This is one of the key findings uh, in 2002 that showed that we had in places at the North Pole and a little bit at the South Pole where you had 80% water ice by volume. In other words, if you landed there, stuck your, uh, your shovel in the ground and dug it up and melted it down, you would find that that was 80% water ice. What an amazing find, and this points to where the water probably went. A lot of it got frozen in the top three feet of the Martian soil. So now we have two pieces of orbital reconnaissance that tell us where the water was, at least. And searching ancient Mars is uh, more uh, you know, high return right now than searching for modern water on Mars because you've got two billion years of history to investigate. So with these things uh, as background, then it made sense to send the two rovers, and I, I don't have time now, but I, I tell a story in the book of how one rover became two rovers, and it was a, a, a Dan Golden in, uh, a comment uh, as I was presenting the one rover. He looked at me after about five minutes and said, what would it cost to do two? So I had to invent the cost on the spot, and it turned out that it was actually not far off. Uh, so, launched in 03, landed in 04, ninth year of operations, uh, truly amazing. <clears throat> I want to show you just a little bit of this animation that I'm sure you, everybody in the room, being a Mars Society member or guest, has seen this a million times, but I want to make a point here uh, that I'm going to come back to when we get to, to MSL. This, this entry part, uh, is the direct entry, was something that was first proposed in 1990. But remember, Viking went into orbit, then dropped off the lander. The supersonic parachute, that came from Viking, so there was a lot of heritage there. 
but then something very unusual. You drop off a heat shield, you lower this cocoon, a tetrahedron, and then not far above the surface, uh, you know, you take out the, the side winds, uh, and then you inflate the airbags. Now, I proposed this idea to NASA headquarters in 1990. They were asking me, uh, they asked the agency, give us an inexpensive, robust way to get to the surface of Mars. And I went there in April of 1990 and they gave them a pitch that included landing like this with airbags. We're not going to put Garrett Reisman, though, or an astronaut in one of these, probably. <laughs> um, and they, uh, uh, the point is that at that point, landing with bouncing airbags seemed as nutty and as wild as landing with the sky crane today. So once it's been successful three times, it's an accepted tool. And things like the MSL landing, I think, will be in the future. But the first time you propose it and the first time you go to make it work, people stand back and, and wonder if, if you're off the rocker or not. Because uh, when I made this presentation about using the, the airbed technology, it was this big guy in the, in the room, the review committee. Turned out he was Jim Martin, the legendary manager of the Viking mission. Six foot four, 280 booming voice, and he grilled me, and he grilled me, and he grilled me, and I, I was, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, well, I've blown it, you know, it's, this can't possibly be good, and afterwards, he came up to me, he said, you know, this might actually work. <laughs> so, similar things have happened to the MSL team, I know. So, let's move on in the interest of time. What did this find? Well, opportunity went to that Connecticut-sized piece that had the mineral that you only see on Earth with long exposure to water, and they found all of these. They found not only these ripples that indicate slowly moving water, they found the billions of these little tiny wild blueberry-sized pieces of hematite, which is exactly the mineral we found from orbit. So that was the first proof that this program architecture of orbital reconnaissance and ground truth would actually work. Oh, by the way, eight years, how did that happen? Well, I, you know, the, my good friends up the road at JPL would say, terrific engineering, and they would be right. But it was also one of the few times I've ever found in my 35-year career, year career in physics and engineering uh, where you actually got help from Mother Nature. Right? Usually it's Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. But at this latitude, the chance of dust devils every afternoon is about 40%. And so these dust devils cleaned off the rovers, cleaned off the solar cells. So that's how we've gotten, in addition to everything else, nine years worth of operations. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, basic pixel size is about like this, about like a volleyball or each ball. So it, in fact, has been able to image all the rovers, uh, image even the little shadow from the camera mast, but more than that, what it's done is to find all these areas with hydrated minerals, minerals that only occur in the presence of a lot of water. And this found Gale Crater. This is why we're sending Curiosity to there tomorrow night. <laughs> Even more recently, this was just published. Watch, watch these streaks appear and disappear. This is a, a crater wall. And what the science community thinks may be happening is that as the sunlight hits the crater wall that is uh, illuminated only infrequently, ice plugs are melted, a fluid, a brine, a heavily salted water flows out, and then of course evaporates as it hits the very low pressure in, uh, of the Martian atmosphere. Fascinating indication of possibly modern water. I won't show you the, uh, the video of Phoenix in the interest of time, but you remember I showed you just a few minutes ago the results from Odyssey, 80% water ice by volume at the North Pole. That's why this mission was sent to the North Pole. At Mars, 69 degrees as well into the Northern Plains region, and it landed. Oh, by the way, this is just, a, I can't resist not showing this. This is MR, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter taking a picture of Phoenix on the parachute as it's coming down. 
I mean, just an incredible piece of celestial mechanics. I mean, these, these guys are the deep space net, the navigators at JPL. They are the best in the world. So it found ice, even right under the lander. We reached out, scooped it up, scooped up these little white pebbles, put it on the, uh, in the inboard, uh, onboard chemistry set, melted it, water. So again, orbital reconnaissance, ground truth. And the whole program then was really fitting together. Lots of other discoveries, but the basic architecture made sense. So what's coming up next? Well, you know, uh, everybody in the room understands that this uh, almost one metric ton, 2,000 pound rover will be landing tomorrow evening. And the growth from this sort of 30 pound uh, test rover on Pathfinder through the 300 pound, 150 kilogram Spirit and Opportunity to this 2,000 pound rover here was not accidental. This was built into the program because we wanted to get progressively more and more capable. Mars is very diverse. We wanted to visit as many different units as possible, and we wanted to be able to get to uh, as far as we could go. So here, 100 meters, here, a kilometer, here, tens of kilometers, all built into the program 12 years ago, thinking about how do we explore and how, to, how do we explore Mars. So just a little bit about uh, how we have uh, moved in the world. We've gone from a direct ballistic entry to a guided entry. Uh, the error ellipse, the footprint has gone from hundreds of kilometers down to as small as, I think, 10 by 14 kilometers, so an order of magnitude improvement. Uh, we've gone from the airbag technique, which did not scale, you can't scale that up much past a few hundred pound payload, now to the whole idea of the mothership and the sky crane. Um, and uh, this is just truly an amazing piece of engineering. They have tested everything uh, that they can think of. You can't do an absolute full-scale equivalent test because, you know, it's one-third G there, one G here. And, but all the other elements, uh, since the failures in 99, the Mars program has learned you have to test everything as close as you can to what you're going to fly, the flight hardware with the flight software. And this, uh, this rover here, rather than having five kilograms of science like Spirit and Opportunity had, 75 kilograms of science. It is the most sophisticated laboratory we have ever put on the surface of another world. And it has three different ways of detecting organics. Two high temperature, one low temperature. So if these complex carbon compounds that are the fingerprints of life are there, anywhere at the surface, near the surface, inside of a rock, this mission, I truly believe, will find them. So where are we? Um, ancient life, I think we have really increased the potential that it's there. We have, you know, slam dunk, no doubt about it, evidence of lots of water for a long period of time. Uh, the habitable environments appear to be there. We're going to confirm, we hope, presence of organics with, uh, with curiosity. And we have the means to ca characterize these sites uh, and do what I'm going to talk about next. Modern life, maybe. The methane results that some of you heard about, maybe. Uh, that needs more work, but the Curiosity rover has a methane sniffer on it. It has a very sensitive spectrometer. If methane is there, even in trace amounts, it will find that as well. So we, I think, will be shifting. Follow the Water has been an extraordinary success. The program architecture has really worked well. I think it's time to shift to what comes next. And I spent a year and a half of uh, my life on the National Academy Steering Committee for what's called the Decadal Survey for Planetary Science. And that came out and said the number one priority for NASA and the science community, planetary science community, should be to start the Mars sample return campaign with a rover that caches samples in 2018. And I think this is the right thing to do because once you bring samples back, you don't just have a few researchers you have hundreds. You don't just have one lab, 
you've got dozens. And you can follow the pathways of discovery, and you can really see and understand things that are simply not possible with uh, in situ surface only investigations. So now just to, to wind up here, uh, let me ask you to dream with me just a little bit. It's very relevant to the last panel. Mars we know today, at least on the surface, is cold and dry. There is now indisputable evidence of abundant water in the past. And so in the future, is this another habitat for humanity? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it's great to dream. Thank you so very much. We have, we have time for just a couple of questions. Yes, sir. You mentioned the methane zipper. Uh, if there were a biological point for the methane, how far away from the landing site do you think it is to detect the atmospheric conditions on Mars? So the question is, uh, if there is methane, uh, how far away could, and if there is a source, uh, how far away could you detect it? Fortunately, the atmosphere of Mars is well mixed. And so even in trace quantities, I think we could detect it where Curiosity is going to land at Gale Crater. Uh, we, it, the mission that was originally proposed as a joint ESA-NASA mission, in ex, so-called ExoMars in 2016, would have provided a much more localized uh, indication of that. Since that original publication came out about three, two or three years ago, there have been a lot of papers published that say it can't possibly be true. So I think before we invest as a world uh, community into a methane orbiting mission, uh, we need to see what Curiosity detects. If it detects it, I think you'll see more push to have a, that kind of a mission. Yes, sir, here. Uh, in your program systems approach to the, to the whole 10 year NPL project, uh, you didn't mention funding. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, having lived through that successful exercise of formulating a 10-year plan and then seeing it fulfilled, um, looking forward, are there any lessons that you learned uh, uh, that might apply to the present and the future in terms of how to get mm -hmm. a decade-long program funded consistently over that time to, to succeed? Uh, it, it really involves... Uh, in part, a lot of shoe leather. I went to an extraordinary extent to convince everybody I could find who had any say-so that this was the right thing to do. I visited the House Appropriations and House Authorization, Senate Appropriations, Senate Authorization. I talked to the Office of Management and Budget, Office of Science and Technology Policy, and on and on and on. I was very fortunate to have an associate administrator in Ed Weiler and an administrator in Dan Golden who were very supportive of this. Uh, but you, I uh, uh, remember being grilled for hours and hours by Steve Isakowitz, who was the head of OMB, about this program and why it was important. And in the end, uh, after all that explanation, he was convinced. But it takes a, a lot of effort, it takes a good story. Uh, in, and out of this, um, what we were able to get from OMB was an increase of a half a billion dollars. They gave us an additional $100 million a year over five years. So uh, right now we have a hyper-partisan Congress, but space has always been, if not bipartisan, even nonpartisan. So um, I would encourage uh, this, the administration, uh, if they're convinced by these arguments, uh, particularly if curiosity is the success we know it will be, to go and, and talk to Congress, talk to OMB, make the sale. Yes. And, uh, Scott Hubbard will be silent.